Welcome one and all to, to stream or not to stream ethical music consumption in the streaming age. Uh, my name is Dennis. I will be your facilitator for a wonderful discussion for the next uh, 60 to probably 90 minutes, depending on how far we go. Uh, we're going to start off by uh, doing a little uh, round table introduction. So my name is Dennis. I had a uh, radio show on CJLO for about 12 years. I served on the board of directors uh, for CJLO for a couple of years as well. Uh, and I'm currently in a band called Aim Low. Um, and I'm very glad to see and meet all of you. Hello. Uh, let's move on to Katie. Uh, say hello, Katie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I've been working in the music industry um, almost exclusively on the licensing side um, for about 14 years now. I uh, started off my career at uh, MTV in their licensing department uh, in New York City. Um, and then when the economy crashed, <laughs> moved back to Montreal and actually was the station manager at CJLO for a couple of years uh, before moving on to companies like Touchtunes and Stingray, um, licensing music for tech. Um, and now I work for a company called Music Rights Clearance. Um, we basically sync uh, music or we facilitate uh, clearance for music, uh, mostly in advertising, some film, uh, some television and podcasts as well. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Aaron Powell, please introduce yourself. Um, yeah, I'm Aaron Powell. Uh, I'm an independent uh, musician who uh, goes by the name Fog Lake. I've been recording and releasing music under that moniker for about the last 10 years. And uh, these days I'm living in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, that, that's all I have to say. <laughs> thank, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> the basics. <laughs> uh, Phil Messier, introduce yourself. I'm Phil Messier. Uh, yeah, so I've been in the music business pretty much all of my career through companies that I founded or co-founded, uh, one of which was called Apollo Studios that I operated for, for many, many years in, in uh, many places around the world. We operated in seven countries when the company was sold, after which I founded Bopper, uh, which I still work in right now. Bopper is a licensing platform for artists. Uh, um, our clients are uh, AV people, so uh, producers of TV shows, uh, feature films, ads, and so on. Uh, and we bopper champions uh, uh, accurate and fair pricing for the music by the artists we represent, and we sell that music uh, pretty much globally right now. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's move on to Alexander Moskos. Alex, please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Moskos. I'm currently the uh, music coordinator at CQT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Uh, I'm also a lifelong musician and jammer, um, sometimes professionally, sometimes most of the time not. Um, yeah, and I've also been involved music in various parts of the music industry pretty much since I was a teenager. And finally, we have, I believe, Jean-Philippe. Hello, my name is Jean-Philippe Bourgeois. Um, been working in the music industry as a musician, professional, not professional, since I was 17. Um, then I moved on to be a concert promoter with Analog Addiction in Montreal for almost nine years now. Uh, and now I am working at Mothland, uh, which is a hybrid company. Uh, we're a label. Uh, we do uh, concert and festival production, festivals such as Tevantour, Distortion. Uh, we do also event curation. We are the curators of the FME in Rwanda right now as well. We do artist management uh, and such as well. And yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Okay, great. Um, so streaming has become pretty ubiquitous uh, for a few years, uh, quite a few years now. Uh, a lot of, For a lot of people, it's the only way they listen to music. Um, and I guess... You know, when you look at the way that music has been consumed and monetized over the course of years, uh, maybe the ethics question can be kind of ported to different periods of time. Um, but maybe just to ask, uh, how do you feel that we got to this point? I mean, um, just, I was actually curious, uh, Let's start with Alex. Alex, how do you feel that we got to this point in terms of 
uh, where we're only streaming and, uh, you know, fewer people are buying, let's say, physical media and, and uh, consuming it that way? Uh, geez, um, tough question. Uh, I think we kind of handed the keys for everything over to Silicon Valley, which is how we got here. Um, there's, you know, um, the, the roots of Silicon Valley have go back to um, even before World War II and making money off of music. Um, things like Heliod Packard, one of the oldest companies in the Valley first started uh, up, started out making um, speaker systems and testing speaker systems for Walt Disney to uh, screen Fantasia. Um, so, you know, uh, I think there's a long history of uh, trying to exploit music um, in that area. And we've, we've done a, uh, we've kind of let them run the whole show. So that's where we, that's how we got here. Um, I, I would I have a question actually, um, uh, Katie, who, somebody who uh, you work in sort of the side that uh, helps to monetize and fairly pay artists. Uh, do you feel like if you look back at, let's say, in the, the downloading era or even like the cassette and CD era compared to what environment you work in now, do you feel that do you feel that monetization is the same kind of ball game from a business perspective? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, the, the music industry has a very long and sordid history of exploiting artists. Um, and, I'm, and I'm speaking mainly um, about the major record labels and publishers. Um, that's not new. It hasn't changed. Um, the major labels kind of had their, their butts handed to them uh, when Napster, you know, kind of came and disrupted everything, which brought us into this technological age where um, somebody finally figured out, hey, you know, we need to figure out a way to, to morph tech and um, access and consumption and still allow uh, for monetization off of that. Um, in terms of how things have evolved from physical product to now, um, it, the, the, the record, the music industry, and I'm including the, the music publishing side of this as well, has a lot of catching up to do. Um, there's still dinosaurs in a lot of ways in terms of how money is paid out. Um, and they're still, in my opinion, taking um, a very large chunk of the pie, whether that's a fair chunk of the pie or not for the work that they're doing is debatable depending on who you're working with. But um, there's so many different layers and complexities that we could do a whole panel just on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to focus necessarily just on the money or on the corporations, um, but do you think that the do you think that the payouts in the streaming age are less than they were during, let's say, the record age, or do you think that they're the same, or or I doubt they're more? Um, the music industry uh, side of it, not the artist side, but everybody else uh, on the the big company side. I'm not talking about small labels. I'm not talking about indie publishers. I'm not talking about artists that represent themselves. They're seeing profits soar um, year over year. So we're definitely not in a situation anymore where they're losing money because of pirating, because of oh, whatever X, Y, or Z reason. Um, yeah. But the payouts haven't not necessarily translated over to um, <clears throat> artists. And the other side of it is that there are songwriters who didn't necessarily record their own music, um, who traditionally were paid uh, a flat rate based on every um, physical piece of physical product that was uh, manufactured not sold, manufactured. Um, and instead of evolving with the times, copyright and um, the industry has tried to shift that model over into the streaming world as well. And it doesn't quite translate. So some people are making tons of money in this new um, way of being and others are not. And that's the fault of um, not only the streaming companies, but the way the industry and the way countries' copyrights are set up. And again, it's so much more complicated than I can say in a few minutes, but, um, right. but that's the gist of it. Okay, all right. Um, we're gonna take a step back and maybe uh, do a question uh, that each of you can take a quick stab at. 
Uh, so we'll start off with Jean-Philippe. Uh, Jean-Philippe, um, could each could you identify like one issue with the current model of streaming that you find to be the the most uh, uh, unethical or egregious? Mm, there is no real transparency on profit sharing. Um, that'd be one of them. Um, yeah, definitely one of the the main problem for me. Okay, uh, Aaron, what about you? What, what would you feel as a, especially as an artist uh, is the uh, kind of the biggest problem for uh, streaming for you? Uh, I, I would say the same thing, just like the lack of transparency. I mean, a lot of these uh, distribution services don't even have real um, phone numbers. You can even contact them. At, and I mean, sometimes my royalties will be weeks late and I, I don't know if I'm going to get paid on time or yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's all over the place. It's messy. Yeah, it's very messy. Um, Alex, uh, do you have uh, do, do you concur with that, or do you have any uh, any uh, other things that you feel are even worse in uh, in the streaming the the streaming platform? Let's say uh, how it, uh, um, how as it works. A, as a musician, I've never really understood uh, the you know the payouts that I get for streaming royalties. Um, but it's not like things have gotten less transparent. It's not like in the physical age you know, they, the record label would open the books for you or, um, and we're not making any, you know, in the, in the physical age, say you sold a thousand copies of an LP, the record label sells them for seven bucks a shot, mm -hmm. $7,000. If you have a really good deal, you're getting, you know, label and artist split 50, 50 50 after expenses right so you're splitting up five thousand dollars between the label and the artist if you're banned you're splitting up you know two hundred two thousand five hundred dollars between four people uh, you know um, so it's not the not the worst payout but it's not going to yeah, change I mean, your no life one's either. Laughing, yeah. you know, no one scoffs at six, whatever six hundred seven hundred dollars that's a lot of money but uh you know in those days that would pay your rent i guess and a phone bill maybe yeah not anymore but <laughs> not anymore <laughs> close it'll pay like a week's rent um uh, at go. this point yeah um uh katie do just you, to, you, yeah i just want to sorry, say that it, please. The, the ethical question it like uh i don't you know i don't think that things have gotten worse ethically in the music business basically is what i'm trying to say so maybe just the technology has gotten faster and therefore the uh Kind of the same behavior can be rewarded more maybe that's kind of yeah i, I don't want I mean, to put words into your mouth i was just curious I, well as katie said i mean like uh at the big industry level the profits are soaring and i mean that's um uh yeah anyhow uh katie as a, a you know as a somebody representing more of the the business licensing monetization side what would you say is uh, for streaming is the most problematic for you uh, well, Dennis, you're spot on. I mean, uh, the the ethics haven't necessarily changed or gotten better or worse. Um, you know, in some cases, they've certainly gotten better because voices are have gotten louder. Um, but the the technology hasn't caught up, and um, there's incredibly uh, there's a there's a not to use <laughs> there's a pandemic of bad data um, <laughs> in the music industry, and uh, in a lot of cases, um, uh, companies don't know who to pay. Um, and artists don't even know uh, that they can get paid. And I think um, Aaron can talk, can speak to that um, as well. We were chatting before this, before we started the session. Okay. Uh, if, if I may, Dennis, uh, there, your question is like, can you, there's a bunch of things that to me, they're more realities than problems they're like realities that have a negative impact on the paycheck of artists and probably the biggest one to me and i don't want to say it's a problem because that's just a reality of the nature of the business and where it is at this moment in time is that the ownership of most of the stakeholders in the business is either public companies or vc funds and I'm not going to say these people are the devil or whatever. Like I interact with the, some of these companies and they're like normal human beings, like, like all of us. But 
the way they operate is they they like if you take public companies their goal in life is to return money to uh their shareholders right uh and those shareholders are probably i don't know some of us our parents uh regime de retraite you know pension funds mm -hmm. all over the country all over the world those are the people who own the music business right now basically pension funds for the for the for the public companies and vc funds for uh uh, uh before these companies go public but they pretty much all, always have the same aim is to go public so they'll lose money, lose money, bring in users, bring in users, bring in users, and then go public and, and become part of the portfolio of, uh, of a tax paying, regular, uh, regular tax paying Joes, right? Right. So I can add to that for a second too, is that there's only one pie, right? If you think about it in terms of how things get portioned out, there's, on, there's only one pie or one bucket of money, right? And how that money gets divided out has to, it can't be greater than the sum of the pie, right? So if we think about it, if streaming services, who, which are for the mo most part now publicly owned, some are privately owned, everybody needs to make their money and cover their operating costs and whatever. If you look at it, that they're taking maybe 30% of that pie, some would argue that's fair or that's not fair. Um, but then the remainder of the pie has to get divided out amongst the record labels, the music publishers, the songwriters, the um, the, the cut that, that SOCAN or, public, or performances societies take and then what's left ends up with the artist um and and i think in order to to really understand the problems um that are there everybody is clamoring for that piece of the pie to cover enough to make their shareholders happy right um so you have to kind of look at how that pie can be split up or redistributed in order to understand how to make things quote unquote ethical while also um, ensuring that everybody's making their shareholders happy and able to cover their operating costs including artists because right. this is always and this has been the classic case in the music industry all of this all of these these profits that vcs or whoever are making are off the backs of of the artists that are actually producing the product and that's not unique to music i mean it, amazon is the same type of model right somebody in some factory somewhere is making the garbage you're buying on amazon how much of that is actually tricking trickling down to the workers right um so uh, if i'm if i'm kind of summarizing this uh amongst all of you uh transparency is definitely a big uh big problem um maybe uh, from discoverability would be one too yeah discoverability yeah because so basically because I mean, it, it, it's it's almost like they can rig the game uh to an extent the the if you look at the streaming platform you know the way you know, you're gonna make money if you're on a streaming platform is if you get playlisted on a big playlist. These playlists are inaccessible. Um, I I mean, even though we're with a the, the digital distributor at Muffin, like it's it's mm -hmm. rare we get playlisted on a huge playlist. Um, and and the, this is where you're gonna get the spins and this is where you're gonna, you know, be able to. So to there's kind it. of a glass ceiling or a barrier of entry at the very least uh, is kind of what you're saying. Kind of, yeah. But yeah. it's, it's also something we have a bit of power on as opposed to, like I said before, the ownership. It's not something any of us can really act upon. Unfortunately, that's that's just the way it is. That's the nature of any business. But what Jean-Philippe says, we actually have some power over, like discoverability has been at the forefront of the fights of a lot of people in our business in Canada, like the professional associations, uh, the SOCANs of the world, the... the like because it's something uh, it, 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 there there's a strong argument that's being made to the platforms that they should uh, and, and I'm guess I'm fast forwarding to solutions but but the this whole idea of promoting local or Canadian content is gaining a lot of uh, steam and it's also part of uh, what's in uh, uh, the new version of uh, the C C11 bill. Uh, that's that's being uh, pushed right now, and hopefully uh, it'll get passed. But it got killed uh, before the last elections. You know that bill has been in the works for many, 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 many years. And a lot of I'm not saying it's the it's the uh, silver bullet, but there's a lot of things that could be 
I'm not saying it will address every problem in the music business. Of course not. But there's a lot of things that could be improved uh, with the passing of that bill, including some levers to to uh, uh, to help with discoverability, discoverability of uh, local artists. C11 is. The, oh, sorry. oh, I just it's the digital rights bill. Correct. And a lot of that is going to have to, I don't, I'm not sure if it's included in that bill specifically, but there's been hearings at the Copyright Board, the Canadian Copyright Board for years um, that still have not resulted in any kind of change. Um, and those changes, like the Copyright Board across all countries, Canada and Canada and the US specifically um, need, to, need to work harder to come into this century. Remember when Sheila Copps taxed blank CDRs? Yes. <laughs> Oh man, that took me back. <laughs> uh, but that got that got reversed, and and we forget about that. But that got axed by the conservative. Conservative, they campaign against it. They called it the iPod tax, saying we're we're taxing Canadians uh, when they tried to bring this uh, tax on on uh, on uh, on. Uh, on a, a Virgin Media, like on cassettes and Virgin CDs, when they tried right. to move this tax to digital media, it was killed, unfortunately, by by the conservatives, and they made a they campaigned hard against that, and they campaigned hard against the C12 for incomprehensible reasons. Honestly, it was very, very uh, uh, um, ideologically driven. There were no like real good arguments on the table, and unfortunately, the bill got killed. So anyway. Yeah, um, and and uh, government uh, is a, a useful tool as long as it's kind of pointed in the right direction. But I think we can all agree that in most cases, the corrections are normally a little bit missing the mark and maybe they're just addressing a portion of the problem and you know so on and so forth. Uh, if, if, if we could, uh, maybe we could focus the discussion a little bit more on, because uh, we've spoken about the corporations, which is, portion of it that we cannot control. Um, but why don't we uh, why don't we talk about why people um, don't feel that they have to pay to listen to music and and whether or not everybody on this line agrees with whether you should listen to me, be able to listen to music for free or whether there should be essentially a responsibility to the listener to pay for what they listen to. Um, and I, I, it's a, it's a you know I know it's a little bit of a hot button because, um, you know, you can you can accidentally listen to something for free, like audio content can just kind of be anywhere. So, you know, do you feel that people should be able to get music for free uh, as a consumer? That's an easy gonna... one. <laughs> Sorry. I was oh. going to bring up, uh, Katie mentioned uh, Napster earlier. And mm -hmm. uh, like, I, I was 10 years old when LimeWire burst onto the scene and like peer to peer sh sharing. And I remember just like, you know, you, you had, you could type in any song and you would have it for free. And I mean, sure. this was for free. And I remember musicians were panicking about, it. I remember Metallica, a lot of people, uh, you know, Met Metallica were very outspoken about it, but they sued yeah. their own fans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. For, for, for millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. Because Metallica reacted like a corporation to that. Yeah, and, 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 the, and we can probably even, uh, even kind of, uh, expand the way that the music industry has reacted to Napster as being, you know, streaming being one of the biggest byproducts <sighs> of it. You know, they found a way to basically just monetize the way that people were getting music off the internet, oh, but absolutely. they just took away the downloading step. Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, I remember, yeah, I remember even being in my, like, youth being like, how is the music industry going to survive this? And everyone was trying to innovate and find a way to make this profitable for the artists. But I mean, you know, being 10 years old, being able to download any song you want for free or any movie you want for free, I mean, that was mind-blowing of, of course you were going to do it you know but and you, you get used to that right you do you do and, it, and yeah. it's just you know it's a funny in a way like streaming is still in its infancy and it still kind of was born out of the pirating early you know the pirating panic of like the early 2000s absolutely um and then you know uh certain people in the pop music and uh pop culture uh world released full projects on the internet for free yeah uh, name your price and, you know, it was kind of a flex because it's like these people don't need the money. So, <laughs> um, but I mean, it does sort of, uh, it does sort of keep the debate of whether or not people should have to pay for art 
um, in, in whatever form, uh, it keeps that debate kind of spicy, right? Because um, a lot of people like Aaron, I'm sure, I'm sure you and Alex, you, you would both agree that um, you, you work very hard to make the music that you do and you would enjoy to be paid for it, right? Um, but where would the money come from? Uh, it's sorry that it was, I know that sounded like just a statement, but it was more, it was more of a, more of a, a question based on the fact, uh, or kind of based on the circumstance of how would you as musicians like to monetize your work? Like what makes you comfortable in this, in the streaming context? Like, how would you like to be paid out as an artist? Um, I'm more concerned as an artist uh, about being paid fairly for um, performing. Uh, that's the part of it that seems like work. I personally love making records and we'll do it for free. Um, yeah. It's behind um, me, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was amazing. I love um, that the, the train agreed. I yeah, the that. train agreed. Definitely, yeah. Um, uh, and that's the biggest, that's the biggest hustle and it always has been in my opinion. Um, and that's the hardest, that's, still hard to get paid you know f fairly for that um uh especially when there's you know huge um a lot of beer being sold uh, a lot of staff in a venue being paid um you know relatively fair wages but the musicians are not considering how much time it takes i guess what i'm saying is i'm more worried about um, i'm not i'm worried about people understanding how much time goes into getting onto a stage and performing for well, education education as a big part uh, as is, is a big part of how people value art you know and um i think art and music should have a much more important place in the in the education system you know um so future generation don't take it for granted you know um and i also think music and art should not be only available to the people who can afford it um so i i do agree and I'm okay with uh, downloading peer-to-peer -peer sharing or whatever, um, but I, I do feel like that, um, you know, um, people who can't afford it should pay for it, definitely. Um, and I, I like what you're saying about uh, the poor performing side of it. Um, as a concert promoter, I've, I've had a lot of people at the door not wanting to pay $10, $15 to see a band. Wow, $15, too expensive, you know? And, that's quite discouraging. It's yeah, and, and maybe that points to the people feeling more entitled to pay less to uh, to hear bands, even if it's live, even if it's uh, people putting out their uh, you know their their the sweat equity that they that they uh, kind of put into what they do, right? Uh, Aaron, uh, maybe quickly, if uh, maybe if you wanted to uh, chime in on this as an artist yourself, uh, what how do you uh, how do you feel is the best way for a, a music musical artist to be monetized? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about that now because I remember when I, uh, if you go on my band camp, all of my records are pay what you can. And I mean, when I started out, a lot of other bands, and musicians asked me, why would you do that? Don't you want to get paid for your art? And it's like, yeah, of course. But I like, I, I just felt like putting it out there for free, like you said, like for, you know, some people don't have even $5 to spare for a record. You know what I mean? And through being able to re release it for, for free, more people heard it and more people listened to it and they uh, became uh, attached to it. And then they would, you know, send you money. So I've always kind of saw music as a, something I, you know, I don't want to see like totally commodified or, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer to the question of how musicians should, you know, get money i mean when i got spotify that changed everything for me I, I feel like i'm one of the rare examples where it's like uh i've made way more money off spotify than i have Bandcamp. but it's not like i totally agree with spotify's policies by any means right right um well thank you for that uh, for that input uh now we're gonna keep uh the we're gonna st start speaking more about platforms now and I know we talked uh, even before we started the stream live about uh, payouts, but we've been talking a lot about monetization and maybe a better uh, way to go for this is to talk about, uh, well, let's talk about the last couple of years. 
um, because playing live has been a little bit, uh, has been very much, uh, you know, diminished and uh, re reduced and limited uh, due to the, uh, the pandemic. And um, a lot of things became sort of podcasts. A lot of, uh, a lot of things became uh, easier to consume from home. Audio content uh, ended up having competition, like music ended up having to compete more with podcasts and uh, ended up having a, uh, you know, the uh, big Joe Rogan in the, in the room. Uh, Spotify deal he signed last year for $200 million. And we're not necessarily going to put the debate here on on the uh, the ethics of Joe Rogan himself, or or you know the fact that he was using this platform to spread misinformation, um, maybe it's more about how audio content has kind of been bisected for people. Where uh, do you feel that podcasting has helped to <laughs> let the streaming platforms devalue music even further? Uh, how do you guys feel about that about that statement? Uh, Phil, how do you how do you feel about uh, you know podcasts kind of competing for the ears of listeners uh, as much or more than music does? I'm 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 not I I've never seen it. I'm I'm listening to you, but I, I've never seen it as a competition. For sure, there's a clear play on Spotify's part to become the destination for anything audio, and obviously this they they're thinking podcast will play a huge role in that, given the sums they, they spend on it. Uh, uh, there's the Joe Rogan deal, but there were other like very sizable deals in, in that space as well. Mm -hmm. So clearly they, they, they I, I don't think it's necessarily competing in terms of like resource allocation, uh, uh, royalties. I guess I, I raised my hand before and, and the reason was that you're 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 thinking of like the evolution of the monetization models and what went through my mind is that i think it's important to to share something that that's kind of understood by most of the players in the business right now to varying degree like everyone will have their opinion but in a very broad sense the role of the recorded music has changed a lot and that was echoed with the artist that just spoke a few minutes ago like it used to be the centerpiece of one's music career, right? Especially in the 80s, 90s, even 2000s. That was like the, the main piece and everything else around it was there to support that centerpiece. Whereas today, it's, it's clearly not the case. For some artists, it is. But for some artists, touring will be the centerpiece. And, and the, the, the recorded music is just a promo item to support the tours. For some are, are other artists, sync is the, 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 the main thing in their career. And mm -hmm. the recorded music is just to promote the sync, you know? So, so when we think about monetization in, in streaming platforms specifically, we have to understand that it's not necessarily... Uh, and uh, like the one thing people, artists, companies rely on to make it or uh, like to break it or whatever to to for to to ensure uh, proper revenues is just one piece. And and in often oftentimes it's even seen by artists themselves and the companies that work with them as just a promo item. They won't spend tons of money on it. They record the the 12, 15 tracks. They have it when they need it, but it, it's just another tool in their tool belt to build an artist's career and generate revenues from other sources. Anyway, I think that was important to, to place. To go back to podcasts, I don't, I, like I said, I don't see it as a competing force. It's more of a trying to, yeah, it's a play to, 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 to really control the audio space by platforms. I don't know if that will work for them. It's hard to tell. The goal as well for all of these these platforms um, is to for it, the ultimate goal is to bring in as many subscribers as possible. So whether you're bringing in those subscribers to listen to music, to listen to podcasts, to um, Spotify is going to be starting something like Clubhouse or they have started something like Clubhouse in certain countries. Um, the ultimate goal is to make sure that you're bringing in subscribers and to get that subscription money or the advertising money if it's from the free platform. Um, Spotify is a little bit unique compared to, to Amazon Music and YouTube Music and Apple because they are the only ones that are an audio only company. 
whereas Apple has their hardware, um, Amazon has everything else. Uh, YouTube is, you know, has all the other, their other stuff as well. So, so Spotify has to try a little harder to compete to bring in those subscription numbers. Um, I don't know if the monetization, I don't know if the, when the revenue shares are split out, if they lump everything from podcasts and music together, I don't think so. I think probably they're, um, you know, the, the amount of money that goes to podcasts is separated out from audio content or from music content rather, but I don't know that for certain. Um, but either way, you know, to boost their profits and to show um, that they're, they're doing well by their investors, um, they have to bring in those subscription numbers and podcasts is just a way to do it. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and maybe maybe the other distinction uh, in the question uh, would be that uh, musicians usually have to uh, have an affiliation to get on to Spotify, but the deal with Rogan and a lot of the other, uh, any of the other content creators is with Spotify. So uh, that is a deal with Spotify. Spotify pays, you know, Joe Rogan's corporate entity, you know, $200 million to be the exclusive provider of first party, uh, you know, content. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that would be a, even a bridge too far if Spotify started signing artists, because I think that might be the, the, the death nail. Well, they, but. they, not to interrupt you, Dennis, but they kind of, they, they do in a sense, because it's important to remind everybody that the majority stakeholders in Spotify are the major record labels. Yeah. They have point. ownership share in um, in these streaming companies, not just Spotify, also Apple Music, I, all of them. And, and the other thing, too, is that Spotify does sign these exclusive deals for new records where, um, for example, uh, well, let's talk about um, title for, for a second. I mean, they... Beyonce, Jay-Z, all of those, Kanye, all of those artists, they have a deal where their music will, or they did have a deal where their music would launch there first. So mm -hmm. they, they do play around and they do toy in these in these spaces with those major players in the music industry, the the not his politics, but the Joe Rogans in terms of size of name of the right. music industry, they do sign these exclusive deals or pre-releases and things like that where they get the music first. So um, they have all those little tools in their toolbox to to bring in, like I said before, as many subscribers as possible. Yes. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we're getting uh, kind of l lower on the time side of things. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, w one of the platforms that I feel is uh, probably one of the best uh, out there for, for bands, and that would be Bandcamp. So Bandcamp is, is a source of ethical music conception, it could be argued, uh, especially the, with you know, the, the Bandcamp Fridays during the pandemic the last couple of years. Um, but the recent acquisition by Epic Games uh, has led to some worry about its future. Um, what does it say about the state of music, um, th this, this merger and the way Bandcamp has been with artists? And you know, this is an open uh, for anybody here that uh, has had experience with Bandcamp. Um, Aaron, you mentioned that you make less off of Bandcamp than you do off of Spotify. So I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, that that is really interesting. I was actually, uh, I hope this is not off topic, but the other day I was talking to a friend about SoundCloud and I was like, is it just me or is SoundCloud uh, kind of dying out or phasing out? And he and my friend who makes more of like, you know, the kind of SoundCloud type music, whatever that means, was like, yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's scary. I, when I heard about the Epic Games thing, I was yeah. like, oh, wow. no like uh the same thing now could easily happen to Bandcamp. okay does anyone else share that concern about epic bank games uh acquiring maybe, bank camp maybe i'm naive but i i don't share uh, aaron's view uh, uh, again maybe i'm naive and all i'm working off is the press releases that we've seen and there hasn't been a lot of uh, info in there but to me that's uh what I see is a injection of large sums of money and like a big, big financial support that gets behind alternative ways of monetizing music. And I kind of like that. I don't think like Bandcamp was purchased for like, uh, I don't know, like uh, getting uh, subscribers or whatever. If, if Bandcamp would have gone public, I would have, I would have been worried, though I don't think that there would have been a case for that, but 
uh, seeing that there's that much money, you know, Epic is 10 cents, you know, it's like basically limitless amounts of cash. I, I kind of get this a feeling that they're getting behind the mission of trying something out, meaning alternative ways of monetizing music and trying uh, more stuff, you know, because of, because of the, the way Bandcamp has been monetizing music right now, I I'm not in their shoes and I don't see their their uh, 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 financial statements, but I'm assuming they might have been a bit tight to start exploring and, and go full steam with new models. But with that injection of cash, I wouldn't be surprised that they start like playing around with new models and, and pushing the mo current model that they have. Making it more further. accessible for everyone. Exactly, which could be really good news, at least in the sense that you'd get alternatives to streaming platforms right now with decent money behind it. So I, I'll, I tend to think this is good news with, again, the very limited information that's out there on the deal. Uh, provided that it's not altered too much, do you feel that the band can't do, and this goes out to the panel, uh, do you feel that the, the band camp model is a good one and a more, you know, ethical approach to streaming and, uh, basically the way that it's laid out? It is, but it's still, I mean, band camp has always been a for-profit organization. Um, they're just the best option for artists with a, a low 15% commission fee. Um, now. Uh, I, I agree that it might not be a bad thing that it was acquired by Epic Games because maybe they're just going to make it more accessible. And that's what I'm hoping, um, really. I think so Bandcamp is just another um, tool in the toolkit. And I think, um, you know, unless you unless you have the power that a Neil Young has, I think keeping your... Um, with the exception of if a, if a company is extremely unethical, of course, but... Um, keeping your your music off of any kind of platform doesn't necessarily serve you um it's not going to solve the problem of royalty payouts it's not going to solve you know uh it, it is unfortunately up to those major artists and the major companies to fight for the little guy um but i'm of the attitude of that you should make your as an artist you need to make yourself as accessible as possible in all the places um so that you can reach as many fans as you can um and then, you know, hopefully you see a profit from that. Uh, you know, obviously for some artists, you know, they're more, they're more niche. They like to do things a little more kind of on the down low and whatever. And that's totally fine. Like there's no one size fits all for anybody. But I think the more accessible you can be to potential fans, um, the better it will, it will be for you in the long run. And that that uh, that point from Katie uh, is a lot more solution oriented. And as we're uh, getting closer to uh, getting to the question and answer period, um, before we get there, um, uh, kind of following what Katie was saying, uh, is there a solution uh, that that as uh, as artists consumers that you could offer uh, one thing maybe that would make uh, streaming more ethical and and kind of better for the soul. Or better for you as a as a person. Uh, if there's one thing that can change, what would cha what would you change? And uh, start off with Jean Philippe. Uh, um, I think like monthly subscription sub subscription fees uh, should maybe go directly to what you've been listening to that month. Even though that's never going to happen, that that would be like a good way, I guess. It's, it's an interesting idea. So even even more, let's say. Uh, a way to drill down to niched content and find a way. Yeah, to exactly. I mean, I, I'm paying twenty dollars a month to, to you know, um, have a subscription to Spotify. Uh, right. So during one month, I've been listening to like these six or seven or ten new releases nonstop and nothing else. Maybe a, a good part, a good chunk of my subscription fee should should lean toward those artists. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, Deezer of all companies was actually um, pushing in the U.S. for, uh, sorry, on the U.S. in Europe for a push to user-centric uh, royalty distribution as opposed to revenue share distribution, um, which was an interesting way of looking at it. That's a huge topic, but anybody who's interested in that, just look up user-centric uh, royalty distribution. It's it's pretty interesting. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Alexander, uh, what would you? What would be one thing that you would do to? Uh, to basically to help make the streaming uh, streaming more ethical. Oh, believe you're on mute. 
Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, I like um, what Jean-Philippe said. I think that's interesting. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic. I don't think you can reform these, you know, I don't think there's a way to, uh, I think we need to look to solutions beyond dealing with some of these um, bigger platforms. Um, and I think that, you know, as artists, um, it's important to collectivize. Um, it's important to make music uh, directly to and within your community. Um, that's the best way, honestly, both to, it's the most rewarding way in, you know, the th almost 30 years that I've been doing it. Um, that's the most rewarding way. And I think that uh, within smaller communities, um, you can share music in, in a way that um is completely ethical because you know it's happening on a very small scale um that doesn't help people make money but honestly uh you know i hate to say it but um get a job because um it's it it sounds terrible but you know uh doc boggs worked in a bloody coal mine uh, his whole music career and so um i don't think music is not something that's going to provide you with um uh, steady income ever, uh, unless <laughs> you win the lottery, which as Aiden Gert from Godspeed famously said, if you win the indie rock lottery, you're great, but that's winning the lottery. And, and you know, uh, maybe uh, aside, your solution seems to be strengthening communities and uh, this and should- it Being a hobby, not being a, you know, and it, within music, there's always a weekend warrior, you know. Sure, um, yeah. But uh, having a, a hobby is you know it's you can jam or you can uh, have model train sets you know right and i mean uh, for the subject of uh strengthening communities uh i would be remiss if we were not completely championing uh both of our radio stations oh, absolutely and, yeah uh, and because if anything is going to be an ethical source of streamed content i believe that both ckut and cjlo fit the bill very well yeah agreed uh Phil, you yeah, got a quickly, your yeah, because it, 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 the question is solutions, right? Yeah. There is a very concrete uh, air quote solution on the table, and that's that's Bill C eleven. If you wanna, if you wanna make a difference, you need bargaining power, right? Those are right. giants. It's not me or you or anyone else here by himself that's gonna make a difference. To get bargaining power, we need our government involved. And to get our government involved, right now they can't by law because they don't have jurisdiction over a digital platform. They just don't have it. The whole point with C11 is for them, the CRT through the CRTC, which is kind of an independent body, to have jurisdiction over the platform. So the minute they have jurisdiction over that, they could start scratching their heads and see how we can improve. There are already, already options on the table, but at the very least, they have jurisdiction, and if they decide, or we decide, or we make representation saying this is need, what needs to, to, to happen in our country, at least uh, they have the bargaining power, which they absolutely not at, at this moment in time, they have zero jurisdiction over the, bar, uh, over the digital platform. So to me, right now, very concretely, and I'm a sort of a rational person, <laughs> to me, the, the, the good option on the table is to get that freaking bill through. Um, so it, It's interesting sorry, that you're talking about CRTC, because before we started, we, we had a bit of a conversation about uh, neighboring rights. Um, and um, I think uh, a good example is uh, Sirius XM. Um, the deal that they have uh, to be uh, able to operate in Canada, the CRTC, is to pay fairly for spins. I'm not entirely sure of uh, the whole deal, but I'm going to share uh, something here uh, in the chat that everyone can read. Um, but but it's it's great, and uh, I think um, neighboring rights, uh, which only appeared in 90, uh, 1997 in Canada, is is an amazing way for artists to get remunerated. Um, I mean, uh, on serious exam, it's it's somehow between fifty-two to fifty-seven dollar a spin. Um, some artists so get get you know like three, four spins a day uh, over the course of many, many months, uh, which can sum up to you know sometimes like in the thirty k range for some artists per year, which which is almost a salary in some ways, uh, which 
for me, it is a salary. So um, yeah, I'm going to share that in the chat. I think it's an interesting read. Um, there you go. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll take and to that. touch on that as well, I think the onus has to fall. I agree completely with what Phil is saying. I think it's very important for the public and anybody who cares about this stuff to lobby their government. Um, we saw it happen in the United States with the Save Our Stages Act. Like musicians can have collectively have a lot of power to get these um, types of, of legislations through and there has to be a push to reform copyright and to what uh, Jean-Philippe is saying is that it's really important that artists educate themselves to know all of their different sources of revenue and all of their source, their places where they need to register their music because um, the only way to solve these payout problems is to fix the data issue in um, in streaming and in tech and in sync and all of these things. So registering your music with SoCan in Canada for neighboring rights, it's ReSound. So, or Sun yeah, Exchange. Sun Exchange. Yeah. Sound and read the contracts, read your contracts. Yes. When, you, when you sign any contract, read it, get a lawyer to to check it for you if you can. Um, yeah, don't do that. Scroll to the bottom and hit the check mark. There. Yeah, that's I accept signature and I'll just read. And it. now a lot of people don't <laughs> don't realize this, but there is additional money if you wrote your songs to be paid from the streaming services for for every single play in theory um, that you can get through what's called the MLC in the United States. But if you register with, you can register with them directly. But in Canada, we have an organization called CMRRA, um, which is owned by ReSound as well. And registering on that side as both a performer and a songwriter is incredibly important to get the money that you're, you're due. And if you're a performer, to make sure you're registered with one of the unions like MROC, to make sure that you're getting all of the royalties that you're due, not just your streaming record label royalties. That's fantastic. There's currently um, a push from the um, Union of Musician and Allied Workers for, they have a Justice at Spotify campaign going that has some interest in from some Congress people in the United States. I'm not optimistic, but um, the uh, Union of Musician and Allied Workers is pretty, a brand new uh, union. And um, some really good, they're, they're doing some really good work um, uh, there's the Justice for Sp uh, Spotify campaign, but there are also um, a lot of things like working groups on musicians with long COVID, um, all kinds of things. So check that out. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, those resources are great. So uh, Aaron, do you have any uh, any suggestions just to wrap uh, the solution uh, part, part of this up? Um, no, <laughs> I, like that's <laughs> the thing. I, I agree. I'm a little bit cynical about the whole thing. But uh, there was one thing I wanted to say, and, and just a little bit off topic maybe, but just something I think about a lot. I just feel like Spotify, in a lot of ways, a lot of people say rock has died, rock is dead. I think in a lot of ways, streaming killed the band because I, I, have, I don't know the list right now, but I bet if you went to the most 50 top streamed Spotify artists right now, they'd almost all be solo acts. And like me, myself being a solo act independent, I own the masters. It works for me. But I feel like in a lot of ways, yes, yeah, Spotify killed the band because, you know, you can't distribute uh, this minuscule amount of money between your label and, and, you know, like a drummer, a bassist, a guitarist. I, you know, it, I, and I think a lot of ways the whole musical pop culture has changed through streaming. And that's just something I find really interesting. Thank you for that. So to summarize uh, the solutions, Phil was uh, saying that there is a uh, more of a, a, a bespoke, almost like a per month uh, subscription. Uh, we had, uh, a, Alex had a, a lot of uh, suggestions regarding uh, community and obviously community radio. Uh, Katie said uh, a good amount of uh, preparation and, and get yourself prepared uh, legally. Um, Phil said that there uh, should be government inf intervention, and that pretty much wraps up some of the solutions that some of us have uh, have come up with. Now we're we're toward the end of our time, and I wanted to uh, get some questions from the chat if there are some, and maybe even invite Francella back if she is uh, lurking in the background there. If, if you've selected any questions, Francella, you are uh, welcome to select them or I can just take a look and maybe we can have the panel uh, respond to some of the questions that I've seen that have popped up in chat. For sure. So we have a question in the chat from uh, Nick. Uh, you're welcome to go off mic or go off mute to ask your question, but I can just read it as well if you have others. 
uh, how can we as musicians grapple with the rising cost of living and diminished purchasing power, both as artists and as listeners? As a listener, I found myself increasingly priced out of buying new vinyl over the last 10 years, which I'm sure drives many other listeners towards streaming. Who would like to uh, take a uh, take a stab at that? So how can um, we how can we grapple with the rising cost of living and diminished purchasing power, both of ours and as listeners? That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, how do we solve all the world's problems? In yeah, how do we solve capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> sorry to go big with that one, everybody. <laughs> no, don't don't be sorry. That was a really big, like beefy question you got there. I can I'm take sorry. a stab at it. Um, there's there's so many different ways you can support alternative media. You know, if you can't afford um, to buy a record every month or or even once a year or whatever, um, you know, I I. I've donated to CJLO when I can. Um, I support another radio station that I really love where I discover a lot of music as well on a monthly basis. So the, my logic is if I can afford to pay $10 a month for Spotify, I can also maybe kick in an extra $6 a month for um, just to support that radio station. Um, record, I mean, vinyl is insanely expensive. And mm. I think for everybody, for every person who can only afford the ad supported tier on Spotify, there is going to be somebody like um, who has a massive record collection and that's okay. I think so long as everybody is doing what they can here and there, if they can't, you know, afford to be a regular consumer of music, um, that's fine. I don't think, yeah. you know, everybody has to feed their families and pay their rent and, and all yeah. of that stuff. And that's the most important thing. And, and it's not so long. I think the most important thing is that you value music generally and you support it when you can. Yeah, buy directly from your favorite artists when you can. Um, go to your favorite local independent record store when you can. Um, you know, um, listen to the non-commercial uh, college radio stations in your cities. This is where yes, the discussions are. Yeah, this is where the real discussions take place. There's no weather talk really. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think um, it's if you can pay fifteen dollars to see a local um, acts only concert, uh, do it. Tip your bartender while you're at it, yeah. if you can. I, I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm I'm not popular in believing that uh, I think that I should be paying more for certain concerts and stuff, especially being on both sides of, uh, you know, the ledger myself. Um, it, it's it, to, to make, to, to do a show, to lug, you know, a 90 pound amplifier up a narrow flight of stairs and, and you know, to play for 25 minutes after preparing for four hours, I think that somebody can kick in a few bucks uh, for that. And that's just my two cents on that. So moving on <laughs> to another question. <laughs> I know Romano asked a few questions, one of them being what is the solution to the current problem? And I, I feel the panel did discuss a variety of solutions. So two questions from Romano here, uh, although they may all be poor in this regard, but which DSP pays out the most to artists? And the second question, if streaming subscriptions rise to try and collect more money for artists, do you think we'd see people start to pirate music more? So which, which DSP pays the most and will people start pirating music more? I believe Tidal is, uh, yeah. provides the biggest payout. When we did our research uh, leading up to this, I believe Tidal was um, far and away, like leaps and bounds, many decimal points up, up the ladder. Uh, pays out the most per stream. So you actually have to be careful with the way those those graphics um, kind of explain how who is paying what because it's there's so many complexities as to how that stuff is calculated and often it's it's misunderstood. Um, Sirius XM, like we've like uh, Jean Philippe mm -hmm. has mentioned, is uh, they have to they're mandated to be incredible supporters of um, the music that gets paid out, but that's a heavily curated system and it's not accessible to the majority of artists. Oh. Um, so it's a closed system that that is responsible to pay. So it's almost like a uh, it's not quite public, so they can get away with some of that. It's not quite accessible, but but they do they they are the ones that pay the most. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's a very you know the problem with those graphics that show like what the which company pays out the most is that 
um, whoever puts those together is usually an artist that says, oh, well, I received, you know, a thousand dollars and I saw I had a thousand plays and therefore I made, you know, this much per play, but it is a very complicated revenue share calculation. Um, right. All of those royalties get um, paid out. And so they're really, and, and they also depend heavily on if they are um, advertised based platforms or if they are subscription based platforms and Spotify's calculations, unfortunately kind of meld every Everything together and obviously right. an artist is going to get paid a lot less for a stream from the ad supported um, side of it than they are from the subscription side of it so it's it's hard to rely on that information um there 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 really is no um they're all equally guilty of not paying amazingly um whether it's the fault of their own or not definitely Okay, were there other questions, uh, Francella, that uh, that were good, or are we uh, kind of getting well, toward the close? One more, just another one from Nick about the possibility of some sort of collectively owned equivalent to Bandcamp as a viable option in the future. So whether whether the panel sees the possibility of that ever happening, um, I'll there, it to you to there, discuss. It, 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 there's no like clear cut answer to that, obviously, but one thing to understand is that running a platform that does anything resembling the, the the streaming platform we're used to these days like they're crazy fast they're extremely well built you're talking hundreds and millions of dollars to to run an operation like that it's like like we remember the LimeWire days that the, the level of well some of us do and uh, and uh, uh, Napster and these things uh, the level of convenience we have in our phones today has a price tag which is astronomical and I'm, I'm i'm talking from someone who's built a music platform and i know what it entails in terms of investment and it's just colossal yeah. so having like community get together and and raise that kind of capital i think it's highly unlikely but i could be wrong uh, I have something to say about that. Um, as a label, we were approached uh, last year from someone uh, in California uh, who was building a platform like that. Uh, the platform is called The Van. I'm going to share it in the chat so everyone can see it. Um, but yeah, it was a, plat a platform, a curated platform um, where uh, you could just pay directly to the artist. So um when you when you signed up one of your artists on it uh yeah you just like straight up their bank account um i mean you you would sing their bank account to the platform so when people would like listen to a record oh i love this record and i want to pay for it uh they could send the money to the band uh, or the artist directly uh so the platform was called the van i don't think uh it got much awareness sadly would put the money in the van just sounds like such a legitimate above board thing as a, as a slogan. I was just thinking that. Is it the van? The van. I put the the link in the chat so everyone can see it. <laughs> Dot WTF. That's I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, that. Honestly, I want to invest in this company just for their moxie. It's great. <laughs> I'll take a look at that. It's an interesting idea though, where they like because they're trying to address the very uh, the very present problem of indirectness that the streaming uh, world gives you there are you know uh, there the way to get paid it's almost like um the same way that you would need to get money from the streamers is like it's like going to the emergency room to get a band-aid you know like you basically go there and you have to wait forever and you might not get what you need at the end you know and that that's uh it's it's a bad analogy but if it's trying to address the indirectness of monetization in the music industry I, that's yeah, no algorithms, no genres, no fees, no commitments, no corporate backing, no regrets, listener supporting artists, pure chaos. <laughs> I love this thing. It's great. I'm going to take a look at it after as well. Everyone yeah, well, should subscribe. <laughs> we have one final question, and then I think we can, we can wrap up. Uh, this one's from Andrew. How concerning is it that streaming platforms like Spotify have created and pushed algorithmic made music that has no musicians involved in it? Concerning. That's, yeah, that's very concerning. It's weird. But here we are, the singular. It's creepy. Freaks me out. I it's was like not ghost aware of music. It. <laughs> it's weird. 
yeah, there was this story about like Warner Music signing an algorithm as an artist. Oh man. Silence from the from the panel. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Yeah. That was the most dystopian question I've read in at least two weeks. I mean, there are some platforms out there that do playlisting um, done by an actual human being. Um, you know, I don't, it's been a few years since I worked at Stingray, but Stingray did have actual real live people curating their playlists. Granted, they still the do. They still do. Yeah. I mean, some of it gets, gets pushed by, by the majors and stuff. So, you know, it's there, there is some, still some kind of not payola, but some influence there as to what ends up on these playlists, but there are human beings on the back of that. And uh, you know, that, that is true for some of these, these platforms um, depending on, on how massive they are, you know, they rely on their algorithms because that's how they they're told they're going to make money by whatever machine is building these things. But um, you know, for some of the smaller platforms out there, they, they do still curate, um, which is interesting. I was good. I was going to bring up, do you guys remember when this, I uh, read it, that 10 track album of silence and uh, he just made an album with nothing. He put it on Spotify and he got all these people to make it go viral and listen to it while they slept on repeat and he made thousands of dollars. That just goes to show that it's like a very exploitable uh, system. Yeah, that's almost like uh, an up update of uh, John Cale, uh, you know, making that four minutes and <laughs> 427 or silence or something like that. But it's a way to sort of at least upgrade it and uh, modernize it or even monetize it. Pretty brilliant, really. Um, and, and in terms of uh, the concern of music uh, that's made by a robot, I mean, I, I hate to say it this way, but good music is good music. It, like if it catches my ear, if like if a robot, I'll I'll maybe I'll follow you. You know, uh, I'm sorry uh, that maybe I'm alone in this. But if an Android can make good music, then bring it on. Hopefully, they're good life. You know, soon musicians will be obsolete. Human <laughs> human musicians. Yeah. 